This is a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King here in New York. President Biden is expected to announce that the United States is going to stop importing oil, natural gas, and coal from Russia. This is the latest in a series of financial moves to punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Now, this ban is expected to increase gas prices in the United States, which you already know has hit an all-time high. Weijia Zhang is at the White House. We're waiting for the president's announcement any minute now. I know, Weijia, they've given the two-minute warning. Warning. What can you tell us? Well, we see him walking in the door, Weijia, so stand by for just a second. We'll go to President Joe Biden right now. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. This is a move that has strong bipartisan support in the Congress and, I believe, in the country. Americans have rallied support, have rallied to support their Ukrainian people and made it clear we will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. This made, we made this decision in close consultation with our allies and our partners around the world, particularly in Europe, because a united response to Putin's aggression has been my overriding focus, to keep all NATO and all of the EU and our allies totally united. We're moving forward with this ban, understanding that many of our European allies and partners may not be in a position to join us. The United States produces far more oil domestically than all of European, all the European countries combined. In fact, we're a net exporter of energy. So we can take this step when others cannot. But we're working closely with Europe and our partners to develop a long-term strategy to reduce their dependence on Russian energy as well. Our teams are actively discussing how to make this happen. And today, we remain united. We remain united in our purpose to keep pressure mounting on Putin and his war machine. This is a step that we're taking to inflict further pain on Putin. But there will be cost as well here in the United States. I said I would level with the American people from the beginning. And when I first spoke to this, I said defending freedom is going to cost. It's going to cost us as well in the United States. Republicans and Democrats understand alike understand that. Republicans and Democrats alike have been clear that we must do this. Over the last week, I've spoken with President Zelensky several times to hear from him about the situation on the ground and to consult and continue to consult with uh, our European allies and about U.S. support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thus far, we've provided more than $1 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. Shipments of defensive weapons are arriving in Ukraine every day from the United States, and we, the United States, are the ones coordinating the delivery of our allies and partners of similar uh, weapons, from Germany to Finland to the Netherlands. We're, a com we're, we're working that out. We're also providing humanitarian support for the Ukrainian people, both those still in Ukraine and those who have fled safely to a neighboring country. We're working with humanitarian organizations to surge tens of thousands of tons of food, water, and medical supplies into Ukraine, and with more on the way. Over the weekend, I sent Secretary Blinken to visit uh, our border between the border between Poland and Ukraine and to Moldova to see what the situation was firsthand and report back. General Milley, chairman of the Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff of our Defense Department, is also what was also in Europe, meeting with his counterparts and allies on NATO's eastern flank to reassure them, those countries bordering Russia, NATO countries, that we will keep our NATO commitment, the sacred commitment of Article, of Article 5. The Vice President Harris is going to be traveling to meet with the, our allies in Poland and Romania later this week as well. I've made it clear that the United States will share in the responsibility of caring for the refugees so the costs do not fall entirely on the European countries bordering Ukraine. And yesterday, I spoke with my counterparts in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom about Russia's escalating violence against Ukraine and the steps that we're going to take, together with our allies and partners around the world, to respond to this aggression. We are enforcing the most significant package of economic sanctions in history, and it's causing significant damage to Russia's economy. It has caused Russian economy to fight, frankly, crater. The Russian ruble is now down to 50 percent, by 50 percent since Putin's announced his war. One ruble 
is now worth less than one American penny. One ruble is less than one American penny. And we're preventing Russia's central bank from propping up the ruble and to keep its value up. They're not going to be able to do that now. We cut the Russians' largest banks from the international financial system and it has crippled their ability to do business with the rest of the world. In addition, we're choking off Russia's access to technology, like semiconductors that are and, uh, and sap its, uh, its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Major companies are pulling out of Russia entirely without even being asked, not by us. Over the weekend, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, they all suspended their services in Russia, all of them, joining a growing list of American and global companies from Ford to Nike to Apple. They've suspended their operations in Russia. The U.S. stock exchange has halted trading of many Russian securities. And the private sector is united against Russia's vicious war of choice. The U.S. Department of Justice has assembled a dedicated task force to go after Russian, the crimes of Russian oligarchs. And we're joining with our European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets, and all their ill-begotten gains to make sure that they share in the pain of Putin's war. These, by the way, are giant yachts. You've put some of them in your press. I mean, some of them are, I think I read one was over 400 feet long. I mean, it's, uh, this is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The decision today is not without cost here at home. Putin's war is already hurting American families at the gas pump. Since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then, the price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going to go up further. I'm going to do everything I can to minimize Putin's price hike here at home. In coordination with our partners, we've already announced that we're releasing 60 million barrels of oil from our joint oil reserves. Half of that, 30 billion, million, excuse me, is coming from the United States. And we're taking steps to ensure the reliable supply of global energy. We're also going to keep working with every tool at our disposal to protect American families and businesses. Now, let, me, let me say this to the oil and gas companies and to the finance firms that back them. We understand Putin's war against the people of Ukraine is causing prices to rise. We get that. That's self-evident. But, 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 it's no excuse to exercise excessive price increases or padding profits or any kind of effort to exploit this situation or, Amer or American uh, consumers. Exploit them. Russia's aggression is costing us all. And it's no time for profiteering or price gouging. I want to be clear about what we'll not tolerate. But I also want to acknowledge those firms and oil and gas industries that are pulling out of Russia and joining other businesses that are leading by example. This is a time when we have to do our part and make sure we're not taking, we're not taking advantage. Look, let me be clear about uh, two other points. First. It's simply not true that my administration or policies are holding back domestic energy production. That's simply not true. Even amid the pandemic, companies in the United States pumped more oil during my first year in office than they did during my predecessor's first year. We're approaching a record levels of oil and gas production in the United States, and we're on track to set a record oil production next year. In the United States, 90% of onshore oil production takes place on land that isn't owned by the federal government. And of the remaining 10 percent that occurs on federal land, the oil and gas industry has millions of acres leased. They have 9,000 permits to drill now. They could be drilling right now, yesterday, last week, last year. They have 9,000 to drill onshore that are already approved. So let me be clear. Let me be clear. They are not using them for production now. That's their decision. These are the facts. We should be honest about the facts. Second, this crisis is a stark reminder to protect our economy over the long term. We need to become energy independent. I've had numerous conversations over the last three months with our European friends of how they have to be wean themselves off of Russian oil. It's just not it's just not tenable. It should motivate us to accelerate the transition to clean energy. This is a perspective that our European allies share and the future where together we can achieve greater independence. 
Loosening environmental regulations or pulling back clean energy investment won't, let me expand, won't, will not lower energy prices for families. But transforming our economy to run on electric vehicles powered by clean energy with tax credits to help American families winterize their homes and use less energy, that will, that will help. And if we can, if we do what we can, it will mean that no one has to worry about the price of the gas pump in the future. That'll mean tyrants like Putin won't be able to use fossil fuels as weapons against other nations. And it will make America a world leader, manufacturing and exporting clean energy technologies of the future to countries all around the world. This is the goal we should be racing toward. Over the last two weeks, the Ukrainian people have inspired the world. And I mean that in a literal sense. They've inspired the world with their bravery, their patriotism, their defiant determination to live free. Putin's war, Putin's war has caused enormous suffering and needless loss of life from women, children, everyone in Ukraine, both Ukraine and, I might add, Russians. Ukrainian leaders, as well as leaders around the world, have repeatedly called for a ceasefire, for humanitarian relief, for real diplomacy. But Putin seems determined to continue on his murderous path, no matter the cost. Putin's now targeting cities and has been targeting cities and civilians, schools, hospitals, apartment buildings. Last week, he attacked the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, with an apparent disregard for the potential of triggering a nuclear meltdown. He has already turned two million Ukrainians into refugees. Russia may continue to grind out its advance at a horrible price, but this much is already clear. Ukraine will never be a victory for Putin. Putin may be able to take a city, but he'll never be able to hold the country. And if we do not respond to Putin's assault on global peace and stability today, the cost of freedom and to the American people will be even greater tomorrow. So we're going to continue to support the brave Ukrainian people as they fight for their country. And I call on Congress to pass the $12 billion Ukraine assistance package that I have asked them for uh, of late. Ukrainian people are demonstrating by their physical courage that they are not about to just let Putin take what he wants. That's clear. They'll defend their freedom, their democracy, their lives. And we're going to keep providing security assistance, economic assistance, and humanitarian assistance. We're going to support them against tyranny, oppression, violent acts of subjugation. People everywhere, and I, I think it's maybe even surprised some of you all, people everywhere are speaking up for freedom. And when the history of this war is written, Putin's war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. May God bless all those heroes in Ukraine. And now I'm off to Texas. Thank you very, very much. I know there's a lot of... I know, I know there's a lot of questions, but there's a lot more that has to be made clear, and I'm going to hold on that until we get more information. Thank you. Appreciate it. There, you just heard Pre President Biden announcing that as of today, the U.S. is going to stop importing oil, natural gas, and coal from Russia in response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Weijia Zhang is at the White House. She was there for this news conference that we just heard. So, Weijia, bring us up to date because this appears to be a big change of direction for the president, is it not? It really is, Gail. President Biden was very hesitant to make a move like this because he said from the very beginning it would come at a price for people here at home. And that is a message that he repeated today. He said that defending freedom is not free. He noted that oil is priced globally, and any time you have a reduction, uh, it is going to hurt here at home. And so he said that Americans have to be prepared to see the gas prices go up, even though that's already been happening, Gail. I thought, you know, he also said that he coordinated very closely with allies, which is another point he's been stressing, that he wanted to do this as as in lockstep as he could. But he also acknowledged that's not so easy for European countries and even for the U.K. because their dependency on Russian oil is so different. However, we can report that the U.K. has announced that they will phase out Russian oil by the end of 22. Now, all of this together 
is going to impact uh, what people see every day. And that is why the president briefly mentioned that he is working to secure the global supply gale. That's going to be another huge part of this because of the doors that he is knocking on. You have Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia. Those are not actors that the U.S. wants to make deals with. But, Gail, when you're talking about the, the pain that people might feel here at home, that's who the White House right now is consulting with to make up the difference now that they have announced this ban on Russian oil. Gail? Yeah, that, that raises a whole nother set of questions, too. He also made it clear, Weijia, that his policies, the Biden administration policies, are not hurting oil production in this country. He wanted to make that clear, too. Right, because that's what Republicans have been saying um, uh, very forcefully, wondering why we can't just ramp up oil production here. Well, the, the president just said that oil companies have the option to do that right now, um, but they aren't taking it. And we did talk to a commodities uh, expert, a strategist, who said that's exactly right. But there's a lot of concern uh, from those oil companies because investors are very hesitant um, to have more uh, production ramp up, especially if it could be tied um, to anything having to do with, with the war going on right now. And so another point, Gail, is that it couldn't happen overnight, right? I mean, when you're talking about the need for supply right now, you can't make that happen uh, right away. And uh, unfortunately, for better or worse, where you can go is Saudi Arabia. And again, that's why experts, lawmakers are all saying this is really a bad situation all around with no good options. All right. We should thank you very much. He also said that Putin's war is going to cause problems for the Russian people, but it's also going to cause problems and pain for the people of the United States. A new Quinnipiac poll speaks of that. It finds that 71 percent of Americans support a ban on Russian oil, even if it leads to higher gas prices. CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger is with us. So, Bill, Bill, but I'll call you Jill. Okay. Joel, what does this mean in, in terms of the cost? The president just mentioned that the cost has already gone up 72 percent. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, we see 72 cents a, 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 is really where we were a month ago. Prices were already high. It is a global market, so the president was really taking pains to remind everybody about that. Look, the U.S. does not take in so much from Russia. It's 8 percent of crude oil and other refined products. It doesn't seem like a lot, but... Taking that offline also means that there is some worrying about, will prices go higher? Will there be new actions in Europe? And that means the entire global oil market is under pressure. Just now, we're seeing another 7 percent rise in the price of crude oil. And we are closing in on that $140 a barrel that we saw back in 2008. So crude oil is used as about, let's say, 50 percent of the cost of a gallon of gas is derived from crude oil. So as the price of crude goes up, so too will gas prices. I speak to a lot of economists who say this is an unfortunate outgrowth of this terrible conflict. Obviously, the conflict terrible on the ground. Mm -hmm. Here in the economy, it's going to hurt ordinary Americans. What do you make of the results of the poll that say 71 percent say, I'm willing to pay extra money? Well, I think that many people, when f thinking about defending democracy and feeling like there's an aggressor in Putin, that you want to say that. But it doesn't mean we don't complain to our friends yeah. Yeah, about yeah. gas prices being higher. And we also have to remember, in a lot of this country, people are reliant on their cars to get to work. We are seeing the labor market open up. We are seeing the economy open up after COVID. This is the moment where we really thought that things would be better. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is that people have to absorb these higher prices. And maybe it's actually easier to absorb it knowing you're doing it for democracy rather than just saying the supply chain. But it is going to get worse for American drivers and consumer of energy before it gets better. Yeah, I think many people wish that we could inflict pain on Russia, not inflict pain on ourselves, but it's not working out that way. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jill. Our coverage will continue on the CBS News streaming network, and you can watch it on cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. Hope you have one of those. There will be more to come on your local news and on this CBS station and tonight on the CBS Evening News with Noah O'Donnell. Many of you will now return to CBS Mornings. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King here in New York.